Hello, it's me, Neil Brennan. This is The Black Podcast. We talk about things that make us feel like something's wrong with us. Oftentimes, doctors agree, and then we uh, share them with each other, and uh, we heal the world. My guest today, I've known a little bit for a long time. Um, that's a thing, that's a category that you can get to in life where you know people a long time, but not well. <laughs> And uh, this will be the longest conversation we've ever had, but I'm, I, based on the three minutes we've spent together, it's going to be great. He was a comic in New York. Here's my understanding of you. Comic in New York. I remember hearing you at Saturday Night Live, had never seen you. And then Jim Brewer told me how good your Phil Donahue was. Well, it has finally happened. <laughs> And maybe you're Bill Clinton. I did not have <laughs> sexual relations with that woman. I don't know what you auditioned with. But your Phil Donahue's so good, I do it in my life today. I didn't do it today, but a few days Give ago. Give me an example. I went, I mean, come on. <laughs> okay. I mean, come on. <laughs> like, I, I don't even know what I was talking about. It just in, It's in my head. You're, you're Donahue saying, I mean, come on. I mean, come on. Uh, so, so, and then he was on Saturday Live and uh, was quietly kind of dominant. You would be in the cold open a lot. You were Clinton? 85 times. Yeah. So that's pretty good. Yeah. That's got to be a record, right? I, I, I might have, I might have the cold open record. I know Keenan has total season yeah. record, but I, I might have 85 is up there. I know what's right for this country and it is live from New York. It's Saturday night. An incredible Clinton, kind of the first Trump. That Sasquatch Rosie O'Donnell. <laughs> and a masterpiece of off rhythm rhythm, meaning like da da the apprentice, like just the, 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 the pinball of it was incredible it's interesting how, how that evolved too because in the beginning i was doing the apprentice guy but then towards the end we started doing things like dominios and um when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie <laughs> say cheese burger pizza only from dominios and cuts <laughs> Yeah, where he was just stationary and, and and just being and pontificating. Yeah, and came up with with what I thought was the most pleasing, resonant version of Trump, which is this guy, this imperious guy, who uh, is is madly in love with himself. Yeah, and doesn't need to make sense. Yeah, it doesn't need to make sense because I think I did three or four different versions of them, and and then towards the end, you know. It was the breathy version that, that emerged. Debates are stupid. <laughs> you should be paying me. And Wolf Blitzer looks like Papa Smurf. <laughs> Once Trump got hold, or, or the, the throng that adored him got really hold him and changed him, he made a different sound. Interesting. You know, when he got started getting in front of those, I mean, you've been in front of 10,000 people. Yeah. Okay. I only have one time. I mean, I, I it's not regular, but there's a few times. But in front of 10,000 people, I noticed within a few minutes that my stride was quicker and my gestures were larger yeah. and I was bigger. In just in a few minutes. I remember Rock telling me he had to do Bonnaroo, but between the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Metallica. Metallica! <laughs> An hour. Ooh. And he's like, you can't look down. You can't say what else. You can't no. say um. You can't say jack no. shit. You have to hit the gas and yeah. not let go. This is a slack wire over Niagara Falls. Yes. Okay. There's no room for no room for error. This has to be a walk in the park. Yeah. All right. So you've had a emotionally uh, very traumatic life. And and it was. And how do you know that? I know that because I watched the documentary. Okay. I guess that's all. I, that's how I know because okay. I watched the documentary yeah. I, when it when you when it was made when it came right. out. Right. What's the easiest way to say all the stuff? Because it is fairly. It's pretty like and then and then and then and then. Well, I think you know we just did Cray we, is the name of the play about the book with Chris Ashley, the Tony Award winner director, and we just hit performed it five times off broadway and amazon audible recorded it and that will be out soon and i think in that those 90 minutes 
it really boils it down, but even better, even more so because the play is so much different than the, the book because the book, you know, we were doing it and Amazon, I mean, uh, Harper Collins thought they had a book. They wanted to go to press and they did it. But I mean, the, the to me, the juicy stuff about this doctor who's a hundred years ahead of his time that I end up in his hospital and that's the cat that fi finally figures out what the hell is wrong. Back with me him. into that. Like, how how did that come to be? Because let's say somebody has no idea. Okay, so I had been to 30-something shrinks, and no one really knew what was wrong with me, and I had been diagnosed. Um, You're you know, 35 at this point? Huh? 35? Yeah, I'm in my, I'm coming up on 40, something and like you've that. And you've been on, you were on SNL? Oh, no, I, I wasn't on SNL until I was 39. Okay. That was when I, I mean, I was carried out of NBC in a straitjacket. Literally. Literally. The ambulance came and the straitjacketed me. So you could see I was in some turmoil. Yeah. And no one able to explain it to me. What were you saying to therapists and what did they think it was? Listen, in, in those days and maybe to some extent today, if you have unexplained moods with no corresponding incident, you, nothing happened today but you feel different in the afternoon you feel gloomy and depressed and all that so that would be one of the polars you're a bipolar right unipolar and all that and um then finally i guess about 20 years ago same someone came up with this whole ptsd concept and this doctor was able to get up inside my brain using colors this is the, why he's such a genius he um i have synesthesia meaning i color code things before I can actually understand. Yeah, I've heard you talk about impressions and voices that way. Right? All the voices out of color. So someone, Donald Trump is? He was, um, um, I call it mauve. Sure. And Al Gore? Brown. Okay. <laughs> so so this doctor comes in his one day, one day, and he's like, you know, what color was Porky the Pig? I'm like, yellow. Bugs Bunny, Aqua, Geraldo Rivera, um, ink blue with little streaks of orange, Bill Clinton, orange. Synesthesia wasn't a well-known thing either. No. By the way, like now it kind of is, but. Yeah, and so the play is, real. It, that's a large part of the play, is is me, this doctor coming in and going and, and finding out what's wrong with me based on the way I color-coded things. Um, we've been through all these characters and we've been all through the jobs and they have all these colors, but none of them are colored red. What's up with that? Where was the red where you grew up? There had to be red. And once I told him about this hibiscus bush, he figured the whole thing out because it had been a series of, I don't know if you know what like what your understanding of a flashback is. My understanding is it becomes keen in your mind's eye and you feel it. Yep. But I'm not like looking at it. Right. I'm not hallucinating and all that. You're so experiencing I, it in a wide, like in a wide Yeah, lens. so I would have these ones that involved, you know, red colors and, um, and, and thumping sounds like that. And what this guy was able to figure out was that was a hibiscus bush thumping against a window. I mean, I don't want to give the whole plot away. Well, but, yeah, but I'm not, it, without giving the plot of it away. Is there a was it the is was it an abuse situation? Yeah, right. And that was maybe your POV or something. Yeah, and it was and it was a really dicey situation because uh, when it was going on, you know, like my father's at work and the only one there is our. The, the I, I think the only person that was giving me any love at all was our housekeeper, Murtis, and Murtis had to stop it from happening. And, you know, it got dicey in there. It got dicey, man. And uh, so I started color coding things. I was talking like Porky Pig when I was seven, you know, eight years old. Yeah, a friend of mine, I don't know if you remember Randy Pearlstein, but he used sure. to say, anyone who does voices is trying to escape what they are. And I always think about that when someone does and, a lot and, of And the impressions. funny thing is, you know, my one of my doctors said it's Mother Nature's brilliant response to trauma. Yeah. That's what your impressions. That's what your brain did with it. Yeah. And there's the colors and there's the impressions and all, but sure. Yeah, it seems like Jim Carrey was doing the same. He just wanted like, let me not be this skinny 
poor kid, and let me be Clint Eastwood or Clint Eastwood. <laughs> James Dean or sure and like desperately and you can feel it you, I never felt your desperation you, it seemed like you could just get in the pocket on these things they weren't intense they weren't hard to watch you know what I mean some of Jim's are like intense <laughs> Jim on the Tonight Show it's just like God I like I shouldn't be seeing this James Dean <laughs> A yeah. person can tort themselves to try to get away from how it feels to be them most of the time. If you've got nothing to do and you're you're waiting for your Uber to show up, just do do a three minute um, clip of Best of Jim Carrey. Mm -hmm. Holy moly! Mm -hmm. Yes, the guy's so gifted. Good God! Yeah, and he was out there doing his own thing in some other stratum too. It's almost like some. Part of his thing were, the, were those weird existential paintings. Boy, you like you're saying, he is bringing the heat. I don't know what his like sort of inspiration is now, but my it looked like, based on what you're saying, that it was truly like an escape. Yeah, and then what about the idea that the the performer goes through years of therapy and his the therapy is very successful, and he kind of just starting to have some pretty good days once in a while, like as a place that I'm in. Um, and after a while, you're like, I don't know if I want to do that anymore. I just did a show with Jay Moore in Vegas. I did 50 impressions, like 50. Too many? No. But at the same time, I'm like, this is a little, I don't know. Well, yeah. Uh, yes. If you're, you're free to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that. I'm I'm getting to the point where I'm like I was talking to somebody about this the other day where we were just kind of like this is great but this you know I, I was doing it to feel better. Oh hell yeah. And I it did make me feel better. Yeah. And you know what else made me feel better? Other stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that now I feel better. And I'm not saying like and this is our retirement announcement i'm just saying if i don't if i'm if i'm doing something to be happy and then i can do it without it i'm not i probably am not going to keep doing it right you're not gonna you're not gonna you know i used to tell people you want to be successful on <clears throat> on a weekly basis on snl you got to be prepared to lose a thumb yeah i mean bro you're in a fight yeah by the way you might fight lose a thumb and you won <laughs> do you know what i mean like you should see what happened to whomever you fought they lost an arm and you're you got in the cold open or you got your sketch in the first half hour or whatever yeah and that's that's you know that's sort of what is the motor on that place but for better or worse well well the motor is the end of the year there are people that are going to show up and they're going to judge you on what you did that year and they don't care that you got into a slump because the, the the scaffolding you need for your favorite character just couldn't get in from Brooklyn. Yeah. Or because Helen Hunt wanted to sing a Christmas carol. <laughs> they don't care. Yeah. You, you ain't in the show. You came to gamble. You came to pan for gold here. Binary. Yeah. Good or not. Binary. Wow. Yeah. You were either on the show and did great. You either crushed it or you weren't helpful. It's a show about hitting home runs. Yeah. It's also a talent. Sh it's a sketch contest. It's a weekly sketch contest. I mean, when I think about, you know, over the years, I, I didn't feel like I was in the show as much. And someone said, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you're in the show. Just the ball has to go over the fence. Well, because that's why I said you were like a quiet. You were. It's like I. I bet Lauren understood. You know what I mean? I bet he Lauren did. was like, this guy is an earner. This guy's going to earn me nine laughs in the first six minutes of my television show. He wants a 5% bump. Give him 6%. <laughs> like, why can he, why is he so good under pressure? Yeah. That's and what he used to say stuff like that. About you. Yes. And did you feel the pressure or was your life so much, it was your life more pressure than doing the, doing a color impression? I don't want to say this is really bad. I think you probably hit the nail on the head. 
I've been in pressurized situations where you have to behave as if it's not happening. Yeah. If you're going to get out of this, you can't offend the people that are doing it to you. Mm -hmm. So when you, when, when you have to adopt, you have to lock in to pull this off. Um, that's a skill you learn over the years. Does that make sense to you? I'm living it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think doing stand up is, you know, my buddy Bijan says like, you're getting to a car accident every night. And we just train ourselves to either we like kind of structure a helmet around our heads or we make it seem like it's, or we just, we get our, it's, we're astronauts and we just get used to it. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Therapy. I talk about it all the time in life. Those of you who, who speak to me in life know that I talk about therapy a lot. And uh, yeah, I believe in it. Therapy can help you take stock of your progress and set achievable goals for the next six months. I'm looking at improving my inner monologue, guys. That's something I've gotten way better at in the last six months to a year. Therapy's helped me with that. Therapy's helpful with boundaries. Huge with boundaries. It makes you set goals for yourself, and then you can sort of check in and see how they're going with your therapist. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist any time for no additional charge. Take a moment. Visit betterhelp.com slash N-E-A-L today to get 10% off your first month. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot C-O-M slash N-E-A-L. Go to betterhelp.com slash Neil and make your whole thing better. I would have said I love you, but I've drawn a boundary. See? Works. You ever uh, lift a little too hard or just forget to apply your daily deodorant and get hit by a truckload of BO from all directions? And you go, who is that? And you, there's no one in the room. Does that three-in-one shampoo leave you needing a second shower just a few hours after the first? From the founders of Lumi, Mando Whole Body Deodorant is helping men conquer their odor in a new way. Formulated with mandelic acid, Mando has long-lasting 72-hour odor control that actually stops odor before it starts. Best part is, you can put Mando literally everywhere. Pits, packages, feet, skin, skin folds, back, knees, everywhere. To top it off, Mando Cologne Quality Scents were created with men in mind. Pro tip, try their best-selling scent, bourbon leather. Legitimately good wearing it now. You can't smell it, but you can imagine it. It's a game changer. Once you experience fresher underarms, a fresher package, and fresher feet, you'll never go back. Special offer. New customers get $5 off a starter pack with our exclusive code and link. Use N-E-A-L at shopmando.com. That's S-H-O-P-M-A-N-D-O.com. Use code Neil. Again, bourbon leather's good. Oh, I I looked on uh, Reddit the other day. They were like, why, why aren't there more places to deodorize than your pits? There are, dummy. It's from uh, the creators of Lumi. It's called Mando. Uh, I've used it on my thing. I go here and in the back sometimes. Uh, it doesn't streak, which I appreciate. You know, I, I hate a streak. Mando Starter Pack is perfect for new customers. It comes with a solid stick deodorant, cream tube deodorant, two free products of your choice, like mini body wash and deodorant wipes, and free shipping. Luckily, I have a discount code to help you get hooked on my favorite smelling whole body deodorant on the market. New customers get $5 off a starter pack with our exclusive code that equates to over 40% off your starter pack. Use code NEAL at shopmando.com. Dot com. That's S H O P M A N D O dot com. And the code is Neil. It's time to smell better naked. Your partner will thank you. They're going to say, Oh, Mando. All right. So beyond the, the, the play and all that stuff, like what it seems like it's severe trauma uh -huh. and didn't really, and this is in the seventies. And no one really talked about stuff like that. There was like what is now a gigantic social movement in terms of mental health would used to be one, two movies per year <laughs> about any sort of emotional disturbance. You must have felt just like totally un alone. Picture this. Okay. 
the crime is not as bad as being expected not to talk about it and living with that because the the, the perpetrator between a contract the basic uh, co- perp and victim is I'll do worse to you if you talk about this right you know that headset of, of monster that walks in and gets angry at you because you yelp when he kicks you 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 don't want to take it. That's the thing. I've I've learned. I've read so much about these guys and and gals. Yeah. Can I say that it was your mother? Do you mind if I say that? Well, you can say that. Yeah. Um. um but man, I, not the proverbial mother joke. It was literally his mother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yes, and that's. Uh, I'm going to go on the record as saying that's maybe the most sacred contract on earth between a mother and a child. Yeah. And was violated soon and regularly. They said I would have been the next son of Sam, son of Sam if it wasn't for Murtis, our um, housekeeper. She was just empathetic. She loved me. No, my, she, man, took me for walks, sat in the lap, you know, like she was like doing mom stuff because the other one was off in her own world. Were there points where you tried to mention it and realize that how different things were that's what the cutting was all about that's a that's a smoke signal that's a message in a bottle my understanding of cutting is you're you're try, again you're trying to get away from the feeling of being you well it creates a crisis that's more manageable than the one that's going on in your head so yes you you are getting away from being you another reason is just to billboard it like so, some adult would go, you have seven cuts on your forearm. How old are you at this point? 17 years old. And did you know it was a thing you could, did, you know what I mean? Now you, did you. Or, or even why I was it. doing it. You just found yourself doing it. And and it was a great release. You know, it created a crisis that, that was more manageable than the one going on in my head. That was easy to fix. Because, you know, none of these cuts are, you know, that's not a death march. This just like let me t- release this v- valve, yeah, and let this pressure come out. But the other part of it is me wanting someone in my world to st- say, "Hey, dude, what is wrong with you?" Anyone, anyone, and Murtis wouldn't ask you; she would just care for you. Yes, it was just like uh, she knew what was wrong, but what was she going to do? Right. There was a day when there was a, per, you know, the the climax of the play and, and what we find out in the play and what this doctor gets me to remember in real life is a particular incident involving a knife and the bushes and the, the hibiscus bush and all of that. So Murtis had to be the one that stopped it from happening. Mm, probably and risking her job. And much more. I mean, that, that was back in it. That, that was back in a day where you could disappear. You know, we heard stories of guys who were gay that were dragged on the back of a wagon, tortured. You know, that element was there. And I'm not sure it's the only place in the world it existed, but maybe it is. But stuff could happen Florida? To you. This is just Florida, right? Yeah. But, I mean, there was a football coach fired because he'd won two state t- championships and he got fired because someone saw him holding hands with a dude at the, yeah. at, at, at the day's end. Yeah. Things used to be real homophobic and real racist and real disorganized and real the same, probably the same amount of corrupt. And, and there were a certain p- parts of the population that could be abused physically. You know, child abuse wasn't illegal till 1965. Yeah, spousal—I yeah. mean, spousal rape wasn't illegal till '79, I believe. Yeah. So you're probably you were alive, and you know what I mean. Like you were in the window of legal child abuse. So it was like legal, and then it's not like. And then once it became illegal, it was they stopped. <laughs> <laughs> and then they clean their own. No more child abuse. Yeah, they're like, oh no. Like, we didn't know. Well, now that it's illegal, we never would. <laughs> um, did you did so did you ever, besides the billboards that you were putting on your arm and the 
what did you did anyone ever say anything so finally i was in the er and at uh, for cutting yes for cutting at cornell hospital and this do they think it was suicide or they just thought he? no one thought it was suicide or they would have not let me leave got it and this doctor brings me this hallelujah chorus moment which is you're this way because of something that happened to you we just have to find out what that is and you're how old 39 40 so you're cutting is that when they you got taken one in the straitjacket I don't know. There's like a four or five year period there where things were pretty rocky. But the, the, the interesting feature was about that to me was I was still I was delivering the, these performances. Yeah. Almost as if being out there, you know, like the silver surfer on my on my board was was sort of uh, transporting me in a way that, you know, really gave me relief. And was it to to use the, you know, disassociation thing is is that what like lauren hired you t 20 weeks a year to disassociate <laughs> someone suggested it to me not even in a bad way but i'm just you know not like someone suggested it was that 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 that's what was going on but um from what i know of disassociation and times that i have disassociated um being able to handle a script in front of 16 million people with five camera angles yeah. and cords and cables all over the place and A-Rod standing there you know or Paul McCartney being yeah. able to handle all of that I doubt it you could do that in a yeah, dissociative okay. state and and okay what I yes but maybe the pressure like we said allowed you to focus on something yeah something that required like I who, hyper focus when you're at Cornell and they say this is because of something that happened to you is your first do you know what it is do you go let oh, me, let me throw this at you and see if it means anything all right your soul knows before your brain will accept it yeah you know she's cheating you know they're lying I knew something was terribly wrong and that it involved my family I knew it, but how do you go up against that? How the hell do you go up against that? That's against nature. You know, the thought that that a parent could withdraw their love from you, whew, I mean, that's that's a gun to your head, and, and you really have to avoid it. So, you know, it was a tricky thing where suddenly, um, you know, I'm – there was this uh, all these small cuts and then this one giant cut and then I got it shipped up to meet this doctor who comes in and figures out the whole thing how the whole thing went down and that's pure luck no he's not luck he knew what he was looking for no 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 uh, that he was that at he was the, the hospital guy. and yeah. that you were a patient in hospital the upstate New York that a lot of famous people have been to I mean this cat's got a brain on him that's that's weird so people it's, seek this guy out yeah yeah what's his name do you say Cotby. Cotby? I call him Dr. K in the play because everyone called yeah. him Dr. Penny. It was Anwar Cotby. All right, well, here's a question. What do you think of Mother's Day? Do you know what I mean? What do you think of like, oh, mom, or like, you know, like the iconography of, of maternity and motherhood? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice job, Ma. Hey, Ma, look. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I try to joke about it. That's just one of those things I'm not going to get, you know, have. I live, you know, in West Hollywood, which has got all these great dog parks, and you see lots of nannies with children and moms with children and kids being looked after and taken care of. And it's, I'm like, I don't, I, yeah, bounces right it off. Means me. nothing to me. Yeah, except I'm fascinated by maybe it. the nannies. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that, you that you've been a part of that. <laughs> and what about your? Do you feel or did you feel or I don't know where you are day to day, but like, did what about your dad? Well, my father apologized on his deathbed. He had put his war medals on his chest, right? So I, on his literally, literally all his on war his deathbed, were on, his, on his deathbed. So he said, "Get me my medals." Well, I was in New York about to do a show uh, with uh, Barack Obama, a cold open. Who he meddled? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And um, the nurse called and said, "Your doctor, your your father doesn't have much time." And I, I said, all right, I'll, I'll be on a plane in the morning. I said, I'll, I, I'll find a way to, to, to get a plane there right now tonight. So it was the the Obama Halloween one. Yeah. Well, who is that under there? 
<laughs> so my father still wants me to stay because he wants me to he wants to see me perform with someone who might be a, an American president one day. So he goes off his morphine. The next morning, me and Eddie, who's a big part of the book, uh, a cop, uh, fly down to see my father, and he has his war medals on his chest, and he tells what he won them all for and says that he realizes he had been a good soldier but a, a terrible father and that his sin on earth was that he had let his anger be more important to him than his children. Wow, did that do a lot to me, for me. And and and, and I love you. Like, just that. You felt like, okay, I didn't imagine it. I no, What I felt like was, you know, I had... A, like I have a dad and not and like yes thank you for acknowledging what yeah what the reality it's of my life was crazy what just a little uh, a little humility from cuz these you know parents are like gods you know yeah. just a little humility i was wrong yeah i let my anger be more important to me than my children and i I'm, I'm here i am now they're about to give me a shot, and I won't be here anymore. And I'm sorry. And I'm sorry, and I love you. I'm like, dude, I'll give you the shot myself. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? What was he? What was his anger? He was in World War II and the Korean War, but it was it was mostly about World War II and the things that he saw as a soldier in World War II. Is it what we now call trauma? Yeah. And back then it was just like, I didn't like that. I think they call it battle fatigue. Yeah. But but this is a guy that wakes up almost every night and he's he's thinking about Adolf Hitler. That's what he's thinking about. That's what he doesn't stop thinking about, really. The stuff he saw Nazis do didn't leave him. Yeah. And, and you know, towards the end of his life, he was, you know, he was afraid to go to church. He was... He felt that he had killed people, and what does this mean? And 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 uh, this cop Eddie became friends with him. Finally, got him to go to church. He was, he was like, "Dude, these are Nazis. Yeah, they make furniture out of people, man. Yeah, okay." And they were getting ready to do it to all of us. Yeah. No, I think about that sometimes. I think about like if there was a. I think about like that mentality. Watch World War Two documentary and you think about that mentality and i would have been fucking furious at hitler it's such an obvious thing to say <laughs> like if you're it's like why are you putting all of us in this situation yeah because one or two things are going to happen when you go to war you're going to turn and run mm -hmm. or you're going to get really mad at hitler <laughs> it sounds like it sounds stupid one of, but like yeah one of those two things happen yeah and it's going to make hitler's going to make you do awful shit yeah even if you're an American GI. Yeah. yeah. Cause you have to, to stop him. Yes. Stuff that's going to come into your home in Melbourne, Florida years later. Yeah. And when you're waking up in the night with a scream, would he, Hitler do you remember is that? Still there. Oh yeah. Hitler's still there. Was it a long, was it like, ah, what, what was the tenor? Yeah. It was it? like, it was like a five seconds and sometimes falsetto and sometimes strident. So you get that, that's got to make you feel a lot better and have genuine uh, empathy. Uh, yeah. Did you have, Did what was it like before that? Was it just kind of like, ah, I don't know what happened. No I, connection. Got it. No real connection. What did, What were his medals for? Um, whatever they give medals for in war, in war. So it wasn't like, was it like I saved a guy at Guadalcanal? I did, was it specific? I think there were ones for um, Valor meaning there are deaths involved. And then is your mother still alive at this point? No. She uh, she died shortly before he did. Same hospital and same hospice in Palm Bay, Florida. And what what was your what was the, that one like? <laughs> that was like um, I said something like nobody in this room knows who you are. Nobody knows who you are. And she said, you were always my good buddy. And I, some deep part of me said, easier, softer way? 
back out of here. Going to be a lot easier to move on with your life than if you dove in here and turned this into World War III in front of all her friends. And I mean, it will rip you to pieces and it won't mean nothing to her. So they do this funny thing. My friend Eddie's the cop from the Bronx and he became in charge of security for Jeff ML at NBC. I mean, he's really had, I thought, a great, considered an illustrious career. But, you know, the, the, the people at the hospice encourage you to stay for us. To, for instance, sometimes they won't pass if their loved one's in the room. So we had to leave the room. And then my father would pass. So he passed and we walked in. And he said, they said, uh, um, nobody goes to the other, other side unescorted, you know. And I remember saying that to Eddie. He's like, Eddie, I noticed she didn't go into my mom's room when she died. He goes, yeah, because I knew she was going to get escorted, but I figured it was the other guy. I'm like, you really believe that? He's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The devil. What my father called a verifiable evil, and that is, you know, your past disgruntled, your past troubled. You know, now this is fun for you. Sadist, just being sadistic. Being a like a, a joyful, joyously cruel person. Yeah, it's joyous. It's it's masturbatory. It's sexual joy. I only met one person like that, and you can't tell in the beginning. They're just like other people. Mm -hmm. And look at I know in my life I've been selfish and I've been dishonest and I've been mean and I've been lots of stuff that I'm ashamed of that I have actual shame for. But I ain't never set no one up to bilk their pension fund. I haven't done that stuff. You know, so there's, I'm, I'm the troubled one. You know? Yeah. L not the cat that's gone well, you, way, way from past. From what I understand, huh? you, you, you'll cut yourself. <laughs> You're going to cut yourself a hundred times before you cut somebody else. Won't ever cut anyone else. Yeah. Because it's not, I'm not designed like that. I'm designed to have, oh, I don't know. She, that's deep. I'm, I'd have no, to think be, about be that. Go. No, I don't know. That's deep. What are you designed for? That whole thing was not about killing anyone. That was about providing relief for me. It wasn't even about killing me. It's cutting? Yeah. 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 You were, it was just relief. Valve, like you said. Yeah. Hey, Neil here. Now, I got a question. How you doing on money there, Chief? You doing good? Do you want to do better? Yeah, I bet you do. One of the ways you're hemorrhaging money is all your subscriptions that you forgot that you signed up for. I know I did. Recently, I found one that had slipped through the cracks. And thanks to Rocket Money, I'm no longer wasting money on on uh, that because it showed me like, hey, why are you paying for this? And I was like, well, you know, I travel. No, stop it. I signed up for a VPN because I'm like, well, I'm on the road and I got to keep a low. No, I go to Mexico. You don't go to Mexico that much. You, know, you don't need a VPN. And Rocket Money showed me like, hey, do you need this? And I was like, I don't need that. They're not even the VPN that sponsored this show a couple times. I don't want to have to watch my accounts all that closely. And now that I have Rocket Money, it does all that for me. So I don't have to worry about it. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and it helps you lower your bills so that you can grow your savings. Grow your savings. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions, saving members up to $740 a year when using all the app's features. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash N-E-A-L. That's rocketmoney, R-O-C-K-E-T-M-O-N-E-Y.com slash N-E-A-L, rocketmoney.com slash Neil. Bang. Bang. You, you talk about your dad and you, I, I literally Hitler, right? And the thing I think about those, the, the, it, the thing that would make me so crazy if I'd been alive then is like, motherfucker, I get 60, 70, 80 years on this planet and I have to spend it doing this because you're, because you're such a piece of shit. It affects my life. My whole family tree. Yeah, and then in your case, it's your whole family tree 
uh, and and then I but I think about the the abuse you went through, and it's still affecting you. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're gonna walk with a limp. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna pay homage to those that event the rest of your life. Do you know what I mean? I know exactly. With the what cognitive you mean. therapy, with the yoga, with the Epsom salt baths, with the bio neurofeedback, with the two shrinks a week, you're gonna pay. You're gonna pay for that. It's like they did the crime, and you're gonna do the time. Like you gotta go through that period. You were like, I can't, I can't have that chip on my shoulder of the bitterness that I have to do all this. Well, yeah, because I'm, I would never stop drinking. Oh, okay. And it, you feel like that's uh, who knows? No one knows exactly what. There's no one reason why people drink, but you think you drank through your twenties and thirties, right? And then did you yeah, stop in your I, in your forties or no? Uh, uh, sometimes there were three three years, four years, five years, two years, you know, in different spurts. But um, uh, I, I loved that whiskey boy, huh? Yeah, I, what's not to like if you're in the state you're in? If you can do it, it's a ticket out of the state. Yeah, but then you get into the like with me, I, I contracted diabetes. How? No, type two? Yeah, living in New Orleans and eating sugar, salt, flour, and, and alcohol, lots and lots of it every single day. Do that for a number of years, you'll be you'll have type two diabetes. And did you have the, you got a little blind and then you like, did you have the pre-diabetic thing or you just went straight to it? No, I, 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 um, have always been good about getting checkups in my life. And so I, I got, I, I moved out of new Orleans because, um, you know, I just want to party there. You know, I think spirits are transferable and I, I could slip into that really easily. And I, you know, I, I love that city, but I tend I tend to party when I'm down there. Say more about spirits are transferable. Spirits are transferable. Like if you're at a game and you're all on the same, you're you're rooting for the same team. Everyone gets fired up and you cheer. If for a team you don't even know what the sport, like what whoever the rules it is, are. You're, yeah, whoever it is you're hanging out with, you're gonna catch what they have. Yeah, you literally are having a spiritual experience. You can go to the game feeling so so, and leave the game feeling jazzed up. Yeah, something spiritual happened. A, con a contagion. Yeah. And you would get like that. You'd well, wake up in New Orleans, you'd have beads on. Oh, I, I didn't do the beads. <laughs> but but you would wake up. You like, you you move there. Move there thinking what? I didn't. I don't know. I just was so attracted to it. That's a good question. What are you doing this for? I mean, at this time, SNL was over. I was going through a messy divorce. and I um there were events that were there were there were things going down that were really really hard to live with you know and there was a place where sorrow was you know anointed that's a funny way to put it so you so 39 40 41 you 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 and this doctor get to it 50 50 so you go to cornell did you work with them for 10 years no i went to cornell and then i went i i worked with a couple of really competent doctors who were who were you know, coaching me on the idea that you feel the way you think, getting me into cognitive therapy and doing all those kinds of things. But the cutting would still happen once in a while. It wasn't until this doctor demonstrated in this psychodrama, which is in the play, um, where the what that red was all about. Once you knew what the red was about, though, then your you problems have to, aren't Then solved. you have to go through the, bit, the, the business of forgiving the person. Tell me about that. Well, it's when you realize that the, they became who they are by going through what they put you through. Right. That they had suffered horribly in their life. You know? And... and You mean she didn't invent child abuse? Boy, I would have thought so. No. You know, this doctor had me into this thing. So... It's mental illness, not an airborne virus. Monst real monsters hide in the light. They work in the dark, but they are hiding in the light right next to you. Monsters don't make themselves. In order to be a monster, you first have to be a victim. Mm -hmm. That was the 
the process for me to to stop hating. On her deathbed, do you see that as an act of grace for her or yourself or both? I got nothing there. I got nothing. If I was looking for a spiritual, you know, when you say a prayer over the person, some sort of resolve, some sort of comfort, some sort of sense of a, of, of a God, um, I didn't get that there. I got that. I got that though when my father passed. And I don't know if you've been through this when you go in a room that someone just passed, they were there and now they're not. Yeah. And it seems like it seemed like as much a miracle to me as as birth. Just like, whoa. And there these nurses' profound belief that no one goes to the other side unescorted. You know. And uh I started reading about Einstein and his ideas about what God was. And, you know, he he had this whole thing where he said, you know, anyone that hangs nine planets in the air is not a human. You speak oceans into existence. Yeah. You're not. It's not even, it's like, it's just don't even bother. That's what I, that's what I've come to. Don't even worry. It's not for you. It's like some adults are talking shit. Well, he was looking. It, there's an article in Smithsonian Magazine about him sitting in a field looking at a little girl sitting next to a stationary train. It occurs to him that the same force of gravity is keeping the little girl on the ground as is keeping the the train on the ground at exactly the same time, mm-hmm. but applying vastly different amounts of force. Mm-hmm. How does gravity know the difference? Does gravity have perception? Then he's like, whoop. Yeah. Yep, okay. I'm Einstein. I'm I'm checking out. Yeah. <laughs> Too big for me. Too Didn't take long. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I think yeah, it's like uh, just it's none of your none of our business. Yeah. It's not something's happening. We don't know what. Just accept it. And but there are moments where there you can cu- not even understand them, but there are more that are that are more obvious. Like this person was a living thing with needs and thoughts and a heat signature and a vibration that you could detect and now all of that is gone so the dad was a lot of grace and with the mom stuff you just go i don't think it's gonna happen or did did it have no, it gotten my, better my with thing time was i just don't hate you anymore i understand why you're the way you are i got it you suffered greatly and i feel sympathy for you nothing frees you from your perp any faster than a little sympathy for the devil. If you can somehow muster that up, you know, and, and this doctor coached that into me. Empathy or it's sympathy. Like to become that, what do you think happened to her? Yeah. I mean, I, I've come to a thing with, with parents in general, which is like, did they do better than their parents? <sighs> You All want right. you want to give any parent an A for effort, but sometimes yeah. it's hard. No, I had a joke like you know they they it's the generation of parents who were like we did our best. I was like, so you were drunk hitting your kids, being like, this is me at my best. <laughs> like it's not it. You could do you could have done better. Yeah. Um, Check me out. Yeah. <laughs> Look at me. Whoosh. Yeah. Um. And and the feeling of the limp. You don't feel. How do you deal with that in? I guess everyday life. Well, I go to twelve step um meetings. I live a life of consultation, meaning I really discuss the heavy things that are going on in my life with, with people around me who I I believe care about me. And um that really helps a lot. The cognitive therapy helps a lot. Cognitive therapy just explain your cognitive therapy is you feel the way you think. Right. It's not what happens to you, it's what you tell yourself about what happens to you. And it's about reframing. It's about reframing and, and, and identifying distortions in your thinking process. Yeah. Which, you know, you're thinking stuff you couldn't possibly sell to a jury, you know? Yeah, it's science fiction. Yeah, it's fiction. So I do that stuff. What do you do? I do all of it. I do, I, I do all of it. 12 step, done, I've, done, I've done CBT, I've done talk therapy. I've done the, I mean, the, the most effective things I've done, I wouldn't recommend it's ayahuasca and DMT, which obviously would break your sobriety, but, but 
yeah, like the, and those were transformative, but they're pretty, you know, it's pretty I dicey. Mean, I mean, uh, I've had really responsible doctors say, do you want to try ketamine? I did ketamine two months ago. I, I did ketamine in a way that didn't work for me. And then I did it, uh, once I did the ayahuasca and the DMT, it kind of opened up my. But that, that was a positive experience for you. Ketamine? Was the, the first the time I did it was not that... the ayahuasca and the DMT changed me. Yeah, changed my the way abuse changed me, the way trauma changed you, the way abuse changed it unchanged it, which is un incredible. I really hear a lot of that in England. I hear it in England that people are using that to for depression. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's just there's no other therapy that's worked. Yeah, it's treatment resistant depression is the term. And also, I don't see how that's a loss of sobriety necessarily, because the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. Yeah, I mean, I'm all sorry, but I'm all for it. If you can find a way to put those demons to rest, yeah, do it. I yeah, that's what that's what it did for me. And it, but it's you know, I've seen people get a little. It's 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 a little dicey. Yeah, there's the notion that in order to save the patient's life, you might actually have to risk it. Yeah, and that's the and that's you know I almost did it in a I, I was never suicidal and I was it, so it was almost uh but you know recreationally, but it was it was somewhere between recreationally and uh what medically needed. You know what I mean? Yes, um, I do. So yeah, so I don't know. So that's the stuff I've done, but I'm I'm interested in in the idea of that the limp you talked about, and and Just tell me why is that interesting? Because uh, Bill Burr was on here, and he said something interesting that I, I'm positive will resonate with you. He said, "I think about the way I grew up, and I think how was I? What was I supposed to be like relative to who I became? You know what I mean? If I grew up in a peaceful environment." a loving, peaceful environment, what was, who would that guy be? Right. And then you look at who you became, you look at who he became as a, as a viewer, thumbs up. <laughs> but yeah. the assumption that it's, not even the assumption that it's easy, but I know it's not easy. And it's hard not to ruminate over who was I supposed to be. Because I know I've spent time doing that. Yeah, I, I I told someone this yesterday, and I was having a really hard time, and was too proud of some of the stuff he'd been doing. And I said, you you have to consider the possibility that you're doing exactly as you were designed to do. That you grew up like every other human being in in, in the history of this species, modeling behavior you saw around you, and you didn't realize it was just the way you were going to do stuff until it happened. Yeah. Yeah, and if you're not breaking the law or severely breaking the law or, or really hurting, harming people. There are ways, you know, like I just, I'm writing this second book about someone I met once, about what a monster is. And oh, that's what I'm, when you said I met one person. They want to inflict as much pain as possible without actually going to jail, and there's lots of ways to do it. The main way is with lies get that person to believe a series of lies especially if they're love starved and you think it's they know what they're doing and they're doing it intentionally and it's we're talking about sociopaths basically or or severe narcissists but yeah and then you start talking about bifurcated personalities right um and that's where the whole area gets a little murky for me like this one doesn't know what this one is doing you know all of that stuff gets yeah it could be, it could be, it's a little convenient. Because if you look at Bundy, Bundy was this guy that everybody loved and then he had heads in his trunk. It's bifurcated personality. Yeah. I guess. And and that's your conclusion with this person is like, they they enjoyed, it was, it was sexually satisfying, uh, that level, the lies. My conclusion, because this person told me this, um, when we broke up, um, 
this kept happening so she could tell the other person. Imagine you start going out with someone and you believe there's someone that they're not even close. Not even close. They've got you fooled. There's, there's a performance art involved in it. And you start getting invested and they know how to say things to you and read you and say those things and, and open up your mind. and As the character, basically. The, yes. And then you find out, then one day they have you tell your wife about them and the wife divorces you and the kids hate you and then you disappear. And then you come back and you let that person know, oh yeah, and by the way, I'm a prostitute. And oh, and by the way, I've slept with your brother. You've walked, you, a, one person through deception has walked into a world and destroyed it. Yeah. No way to inhabit this any this place anymore. Yeah. You will be in recovery or walking with a limp, as we're talking about, for the rest of your life. This person said, I did it to, so I could break the news to the person. So I could like do like, oh, by the way, it's a lie. Do they want the other person to find out or they want to they, tell them? They want them to find out. What feeling are they trying to get in the person? What what are they trying to inspire in the person? What's the feeling? They want to erase them. They want to hurt them so bad they can't go on. Like they can't live in that world anymore. The mom took all the money and, and then everyone in the family tree hates you. Right. And the kids hate you and are reviled by you. Pure destruction. And and, and you, your friends are slightly embarrassed for you at work and the whole your whole world is about someone who came in and then fuck and then has slept with your brother. Yeah. How do you recover from and that? And do you feel like people like you've attracted people like that? I've, I've I've attracted some really troubled types. And I've been a troubled type. Yeah. Um, but I, I've never known no one like that before. No. <laughs> Brother, you can't tell. Yeah. Even even in retrospect, you're like, this there was no way. There was no way you can know. Yeah. I mean, someone that could say those things and figure out a person, you know, there's no way they could know. In other words, you can like my shrink said to me, you can prepare for the attack of a of a grizzly bear for years and still not get it right. You can't prepare. There yeah. is no prepare for something like this. There's just no way to do it. I get I do training with grizzly bears. <laughs> Maybe you but you can't know what prepare. I'm talking I, about? Of course it yes. Like when that big bear comes lumbering over that hill at fifty miles an hour, you could really mess this up. Yep. All right, here's the here's here's my question for you. Not what that's the thing of like what would what advice would you give your younger self? Not I I have a more general version of that. What advice would you give to someone who's about to be a human being? Don't. <laughs> <laughs> what are you crazy? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. That that's really deep. No, but you know what I mean. Like, because I'm curious as to like what what are the lessons? What are what 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 have you? You know, there's probably a thing in in a. What's the spiritual lesson of any of this? Well, I've seen enough cool things that it's worth hanging around for. Yeah, I've had enough good days that it's worth hanging around for. When you say you've seen cool things, what what do you think of? I think. Of a guy I know who was in a lot of trouble recently. And I think of the five or six dudes which rallied to his aid uh, free of charge. Mm. And I thought that's one of the coolest things I've ever seen or been a part of. And, and you know, stuff like that is a fable to me. That's mythological stuff. Human generosity? Yeah, you know. <clears throat> wanting nothing in return just let's go help this guy and 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 and, and impart this message in him whatever the hell you did you got about five or six people here that really want you to win there's a way in our stuff like that yeah yeah but so, i don't know i don't know what i'd say to someone about the what would you say but I, try to remain hopeful <laughs> I would say what the judge, what this guard told me when I was in jail in the Caribbean and I was supposed to be on trial the next morning, when he came in and said, you know, it's about a 50-50 chance here. I don't know how to tell you, but you could get uh, an honest judge and uh, you're in a lot of trouble. 
you could get someone that wants some uh, something else, and you got a way out. So it could it could work out. Mm-hmm. I, I I hate to say that's the best I can tell you. I, I, I say it, it's worked out for some. Yeah, and it could. Yeah, and I, it. I can't guarantee you nothing. Yeah, but I guess even some. You think it's more than I? I guess workouts abroad is a is a vague. What is it? What you said it wor- it could work out. It could. Right. Do you think for most people life works out? I mean, again, it's like what's the what's the category? But it working out is it it can work out in pockets. Yeah. You know? And when it doesn't just hold on till the next it's work. stormy weather. Yeah. Until the next batten down the hatches and wait. Yeah. I don't know how many times my shrink has said to me, like, has I did you ever see the um the show Stranger Things? Yeah. So they have the upside down where the exact same situation that they've been loving and being healthful in has become horrifying. Same thing. So I would have these days like that where I would be in the pits of despair and gloom and my doctor would go, it's temporary. You're in the upside down. We know it lasts a few hours. You call your friends. You connect with the people. You rest. And you distract yourself. Yeah. Because some days you're just going to want no, no, no new questions, no new answers. I don't feel so good. Just kind of a physical sensation. Uh, uh, synapses firing chemicals, shitty chemicals, and just try to ignore it. And it's, un, it's hard to believe, but it will pass. Sometimes it seems impossible that it's going to pass. It's like the, I was saying to somebody, it's like the, the drug thing where you eat too much edible or you smoke too much weed or you do, and you go, I'm going to be stuck. I'm going to be high forever. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be high. Like I'm never coming back. That's emotions are like that. Yeah. Where you're so angry or sad or whatever that you're like, I'm angry forever now. And then four hours later, you're like, oh, that was, that was weird. <laughs> Yeah, also, you know, those the situations where you're so incredibly angry and you think you're right. Mm-hmm. And then a day later you find out maybe you're only half right. Mm-hmm. But it definitely didn't merit um, all your anger missiles. Mm-mm. You didn't need to bring them out of the silo. Well, they're spent. <laughs> <laughs> Call them back. Yeah. What's the name of the, the show? Cray? Cray. Got it. And it's going to be on Amazon. Audible. Audible. On Amazon. In August. Audible. In August? Yep. Great. Daryl Hammond. I, dude, I hope you enjoy this because this was excellent to me. It was damn good. All right, great. All right. <laughs>